And please mute if you are not speaking. Everybody can mute it. Yeah, mute us all, Barry. Yes. Hello. Okay, the video is stopped here. Can you hear me, Chris? It's Kathleen. There you are. <laughs> Not speaking. We were muted. We're unmuted now. Uh, and I'm not sure about me, but oh, how would they? Uh, we're muted. Um, Are we all muted? Please mute. Just to let you know, every one of these images was taken within the Gorge Telecom neighborhood. I think we'll stop it there and Chris, uh, over to you and we will show more of these slides later on. Okay, so stop screen share, that's it, good. Um, Well done everyone, I'm just get, getting my, we, are, we, are, we were supposed to be doing a practice before this and uh, the practice has not, Jeez, what's going on here? Okay, I'm having my technical problems. Uh, okay, there we go, hold on. hold on a sec, I'm just trying to get to the front of my script. Okay, hello everyone, welcome, and uh, and uh, 
Welcome from the Gorge Telecomus Community Association, which is sponsoring the, this event. My name is Chris Bullock. I'm one of the directors on the board of the association and one of the MCs for today. Several other directors and one past president are performing today. Um, I'm going to give you a little background to this festival, but first I want to thank all performers for their contributions. Thank our Zoom host, Trevor Hancock and Barry Hunt, and thank you, the audience, for being here and being patient. And here are a few requests, and the first one is extremely relevant. Uh, so the first request is to be kind to us. I said there were a lot of technical challenges. I had no idea <laughs> we'd have such a, the technical challenges would be so dramatic and major and uh, terrifying. But anyway, uh, if, so, if Humph so I wanted to say if something goes wrong, please remember Bonnie Henry and be kind, stay calm and wait for things to carry on. Uh, special call out, by the way, to my daughter, Danielle, who I see there, and also my friends, Don and Sandy who are zooming in from afar. Okay, if you're in the audience, please stay muted throughout the event to minimize noise pollution. You can put comments or record difficulties in the chat. You can applaud visually if you feel so moved, but if you, if you don't mute, we'll have a lot of noise pollution. Um, this event's being recorded, so if you don't want to have your face possibly appear in the recording, turn off your video. However, we hope, we performers hope to see your faces rather than see a lot of blank screens. So unless you really don't want to be visible, then please keep on and smile at us. The gallery view will give you the view of everyone attending uh, and the speaker view should give, give you an image of the speaker in the center of the screen, but it's actually not doing that at the moment. I should be central, I am not, which is very hard for me. So just to give you a little background to this event, Lights on Gorge began in 2009, where a few of the association's elders spontaneously decided to de decorate a sequoia tree on the Gorge waterway and sing carols to anybody foolish enough to stop and listen, as one of the elders, Harry Lewis said. By two years after this, around 2011, the events had gained its name and become more elaborate with tents and hot chocolate and roasted chestnuts. After a couple of extremely chilly years where we didn't want to be outside, most of the events moved into the uh, Victoria Canoe and Kayak Club's boardroom, thanks to their generosity. And from 2014 till this year, the festival had pretty much the same shape with lantern making for the kids, solstice songs, Christmas carols, seasonal readings, a live yeah. play, outdoor tree light up and lantern perception. Okay, so uh, that's that's the brief history. Obviously, this is not like previous years, and we're doing the best we can. So over to you. Uh, thank you, Chris. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for giving us a sense of the history of our neighborhood celebration of light. I'm Kay Stewart. I've been involved in Lights on Gorge since it's beginning, though not for the first singing around the sequoia tree. Of course, festivals of light are celebrated in many cultures around the world. Diwali by Hindus and Sikhs, Hanukkah by Jews, Christmas by Christians, and various lantern and light festivals among Asian peoples. Long before these religious traditions took shape, our ancient ancestors' lives, and still many indigenous people's lives, are tied to the seasons, seasons of hunting, of planting, of harvest, and festivals celebrated each of these seasons, including the summer and winter solstices. For the waxing and waning of light and dark governs all of Earth's systems on which we depend for life. We think of lights on the gorge as farming part of the pattern of this long tradition. Now back to Chris to introduce our first performer. So our first performer, and Kay gets, uh, Kay gets on the main screen and I just seem to stay in this little box up here. So very hard on the ego, but anyway, that's what it seems to be doing. So uh, <laughs> I, hope, I hope this 
main performers are going to appear in the in the in the main screen. Or we may just see Watch K, which would be delightful the whole time. But anyway, let's see. So our first performer is Rob Wixon, who is our esteemed uh, past president, has a long association with the GCCA, and he was one of the elders around the sequoia tree. So he may say something about that as well. So Rob, take it away. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to be here and nice to see as many faces as I can on my little screen. Um, I do remember the first events and they were always kind of wet and, <laughs> and cold because of when it got dark, um, but it was always seemed to be worthwhile. Uh, it always seemed to be a good place to meet up with folks in the dead of winter and on the shortest day of the year. Uh, around 2014, when we shifted into the Canoe and Kayak Club, uh, Chris actually asked me if I would do a little something at the front of that uh, event. Um, matter of fact, before people even came into the into the into the club itself, and I didn't. I'm not a soloist, so I didn't really know what I'd do. But I sort of sat down, wrote a few lyrics, and came up with a, a song which I call "Going to Light Up the Gorge," and that's what we're doing. So here we go. <laughs> I'm gonna light the coach tonight, tonight. Gonna light the coach, coach, feel right. Come on, put and see the sights. Gonna light the coach tonight, tonight. Gonna light the coach, make it ever look bright. I'm gonna light the coach with the sources of vent. Light the doors during the COVID pandemic. Stay, stay safe under our tent. Even when the rain doesn't make a dent. Light up the court, it's the shortest day of the year. Well, light up the court tonight, tonight. Go and light up the doors to feel all right. Come on out and see the sights. Gonna light the ghost tonight, tonight. Gonna light the ghost, make everything all bright. And before you head to the rest of the night, gotta thank the folks who made this just right. You know who you are as you keep up the fight. We can beat this COVID, bring back the light. Thank you, everyone, and what more can I say? Well, light the coach tonight, tonight. Gonna light the coach, feel all right. Come on out, see the sights. Gonna light the coach tonight, tonight. Gonna light the coach, make everything all right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Get, get off the screen, Rush. Thank you, Rob. <laughs> and uh, thank you for all the people in the chat and my who uh, and my wife who's re reassured me that I actually do appear and speak of you. And a reminder to everyone, if you want to see the performers full screen, click on Speak of You up on the right-hand side of the screen. Okay, thanks, Rob. Over to Kay to introduce our next presenter. How special to have a song written especially for this occasion and for this year. So thank you, Rob. Uh, now I'd like to introduce May Partridge, a former teacher in colleges and universities in Alberta and British Columbia, and now a poet and memoirist living in Courtney. Thank you for joining us, May. And I hope she has. Um, May will read her poem, Listen, from a recent chapbook called So Held by Sky, Five Gabriola Poets. Welcome, May. Good. Got myself unmuted. Sometimes I have to feel around for it. The poem that I have here is, it's written, it was written some years ago when we lived on an acreage in Cedar. And it is a poem about being out in the garden and doing one of the most mundane tasks there is, which is 
weeding and digging in compost, but it becomes a poem about light and dark. So I'll give it to you now. Listen, ravens here, chuckling, chatting, while I place plants in soil created other years, meet their needs, my own for light, for dark, predictable in thrusting buds of broccoli, round globes of kohlrabi, rubbled heads of cauliflower, yet nothing certain but change. Yes, Raven, old trickster, solid and black against sun's light, perch on my fence, play this daily conversation, that borderline against chaos amidst the cooch grass, sow thistle pushing, desires to one end, seed. Give me that word as I compost. Daily death for food, rebirth in shared darkness. Thank you, May. That was very, that's a very beautiful poem. And I've just read your, I've just read your poetry, the poetry collection, which that's included in. So a great, a great gift for everyone. Thank you. Thank beautiful you. poem. And we've been in May's garden when May, when, her husband Bruce was alive, and it is one beautiful, one beautiful, beautiful garden. So I can testify to that. So I can see it would, what an inspiration it would be. So thanks very much, May. So our, our next presenters are the we Lights on Gorges for children as well as adults, and uh, we are representatives of that, <laughs> the, symbolically is the Carpers Family Band, which is our next performers. And Scott Carpers is our unofficial local historian, having taken lots of good photos of, historic, has a lot of historical photos of the area, and uh, is also, and uh, has lived in the area for many years, and is also a, uh, mem the membership coordinator of our association. Uh, Katrinka Carpers is a brilliant teacher and has led our lantern making workshops for the last few years and has, which has had a major role and particularly for, to incorporate children in our events. So here is a couple of songs from the Carpers family band. Well, I hope okay. we're here. Okay, hopefully everyone can hear us. Um, thanks for having us, you guys. Um, this is a song, we'll start off with a song uh, that I wrote last year about this time, uh, struggling down in my basement trying to uh, figure out how water was getting in. Um, so it was a bit of a struggle and I ended up uh, making a song out of it. Okay, ready guys? Thank you. 
It's founding fine. Great. So as a teacher, of course, this year has been a real crazy roller coaster of, uh, you know, shut down and having to teach from home and uh, the joys and the difficulty of that and feeling disconnected from your students and then going back and feeling so worried for their safety. And uh, I really feel this is a turpentine year and I'm doing Turpin Time by uh, Randy Carlyle. family. It's great to see uh, the boys playing along with you. Um, we've enjoyed them for many years now and hope to for many more. Now I'd like to introduce another favorite performer, storyteller Lee Porteous. Many years ago, Lee read about Lights on the Gorge and offered to join us. 
She now describes this as one of her favorite events. Lee is a longtime member and past president of the Victorious Storytellers Guild, which is now holding monthly storytelling sessions on Zoom. Lee especially enjoys telling stories to adult audiences at fundraisers, retirement homes, the Victoria Performing Arts Festival, when it can be held, community events, and other story gatherings. In short, wherever she is invited. Today, she will tell stories about the moon in Chinese mythology. Welcome, Li. <laughs> Yes, this, this long dark night, we still have lights in the sky when there's no clouds, at least stars and the moon. The moon is now waxing to full on the 29th. And there's been a lot of activity up there with the Chinese uh, Lunar Exploration Project. Now that project has named all of its crafts after mythological or folk uh, tale characters and each of the names reflects what the job of that that craft is. The first launch was in 2007 and that was the Chang'e one. Now Chang'e was a beautiful young woman. She was married to Hu Yi who had done a great service to the Jade Emperor and the Jade Emperor rewarded him with an elixir of immortality but there was only one dose and he did not want to take it and leave his life, wife behind. So he was trying to get the Jade Emperor to give him another dose when an evil apprentice of his broke into his home with the intent to steal this potion. Now, Chang Ao, oh, I can't get her name, Chang Ao, wow. it was uh, clear that she could not fight him off and defeat him. So rather than have an evil immortal, she took the potion herself. The effect of that was she began to drift upwards and her husband tried to hold her back, but he couldn't. She was able to take her pet rabbit, uh, Yu Tu, who is known as the Jade, Jade Rabbit. And they drifted up to the moon where she lived in a cold crystal palace with only her pet rabbit for company. Her husband down on the earth missed her so much that whenever there was moonlight, he spread a table so he could have dinner out there with at least the light from her. And one of her favorite things that he put out there were certain cakes, um, which became known as moon cakes. And indeed in the uh, mid autumn festival of the moon, that's one of the things that is always eaten. So if you go down to fairways, you can actually buy moon cakes and join in the celebration of this, of the moon. Now, the first launch of Chang'e 1 uh, only orbited the moon. The next one, 2010, also orbited the moon, mapping the moon thoroughly and collect information and such. But the third one, Chang'e 3, landed on the moon and deployed a rover, which of course was named Jade Rabbit One. So there we were, Chang'e Three with <laughs> Jade Rabbit One. Then in preparation for a landing on the dark side of the moon, the far side of the moon, they launched uh, a satellite called Chiu Chiu means Magpie Bridge. The Magpie Bridge comes from a story where the king of the land of the stars had a beautiful daughter. She was diligent and talented too and a wonderful weaver. She would weave his clothes, but also more importantly, she would weave the clouds that were in the sky. One day in the neighboring land, a prince from that land was riding by checking on his cattle and his horses. And he saw her in the window and struck by her beauty, asked for her hand in marriage. Now the king was quite happy about this match because the prince was obviously very wealthy and a good farmer. And also his daughter would be just next door and she could, could continue weaving the clouds that he needed for the sky. So they were married. 
but it was not long before the king was disappointed and angry because the princess left her loom behind and didn't touch it, wouldn't weave anything, never mind clouds, and spent all her time changing her hairstyle, changing her clothes to please her new husband. And they would lollygag around in the uh, fields of flowers and they would dance and they would sing. And the prince, for him, for his part, he turned over the management of his estate, his estate to his servants. And he spent time with the princess and then he spent time with her as wastrel buddies and gambling and losing money and such. And the king was really upset. He needed those clouds woven and also he didn't want to end up with his daughter and her husband dependent upon him. And so he separated them. He sent the prince and all of the princes cattle and horses and servants and everything else to the far side of the river of stars. Now, if we look up and you see the Milky Way, that is the river of stars. So the prince was on one side and his wife on the other. They would stand on the bank opposite each other and weep because they missed each other so much and their tears fell to the earth as a rain. And the more they wept, the more rain came down and there were floods, houses washed away, trees washed away and the birds got together to have a conference on what to do, how to save the earth. They decided that the key thing was to get the two lovers together so they'd stop crying. And so the magpies volunteered to fly up to the river of stars and create a bridge beak to tail across the river of stars. And up they flew all the magpies from all the earth around and around seven times until they got there. And they created this bridge of magpies. So the two lovers ran together and embraced and stopped crying. And so the earth was saved. But the king still said, you two are bad for each other and should not be together. And so you're only allowed one day, one day when the magpies who have taken pity on you can come up and create this bridge. And that will be the seventh day of the seventh lunar month. And so it is to this day and down on earth in China, that day is celebrated as a day of romance and love, something like Valentine's Day. And on that day, it's said, you will not find a magpie because they are all up in the land of the stars creating the bridge. And on that day, it never rains because no one is crying up there. <laughs> so the satellite was sent up and it was positioned in what's called a Lagrand uh, point where it is exactly between the gravitation of the earth and the moon and stays in that one place. And from that position, it could see, connect with the dark side of the moon and with earth. And so it communicates, it's the bridge. And so what happened then is Chang'e 4 was launched and it landed on the dark side of the moon, on the far side and without the Magpie Bridge, it cannot communicate with the earth at all. And so that's what the magpie bridge is doing. Not only that, but two little micro satellites were launched. And those little guys were called Longchun, which means Dragon River. They were named that in honor of the great dragons in the past who had given up their lives to create four great rivers in China to benefit the people. Those who are the Amur River, the Yellow River, the Yangtze and the Pearl were created from the sacrifice of these great dragons. These two little satellites, their job was to be sent out and in the shadow of the moon to measure low, low frequency radiations that they'd never be able to, re to read because of the, what comes from the earth. And after they had done that, they were to crash. And both of them did. So they sacrificed, just as the dragons had, for the benefit of human beings. And that launch, Chang'e 4, was successful. It landed where no other soft landing has been made on the far side of the moon and deployed Jade Rabbit 2, 
the other lander out on the on the uh, dark side there too, and did its research and was able to communicate that with the Earth. Well, then we had Chang'e 5. That was launched November 24th, and that ship landed on a vast magna plane called the Ocean of Storms on our side of the moon. And it consisted of a number of components, but part of the satellite came down with a, a lander and a, um, a sender, they called it. And it drilled six and a half feet into that magna, collected four and a half pounds of moon rocks, piled it in to, to the, the lander and then shifted it to the ascender, which climbed back into orbit and connected up with that satellite and returned to Earth on Thursday in Mongolia with parts of the moon. We don't know what Chang Yu would have thought of that, considering that she wanted to come back to the Earth, but only part of it came back. So she is still up there in her cold crystal palace with her pet rabbit, only for company. And if on the 29th it's clear, you could look up and see the full moon. And if you look at it in just the right way, instead of the man in the moon, you may be able to see Jade Rabbit, who is on his haunches, and he has a mortar and pestle in front of him. And he's making either more elixir, or perhaps he's pounding rice. And that's my account of what's going on up in the moon. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Lee. <laughs> that's, a, that's a lovely story and a w very <laughs> interesting combination of modern and old stories tied together. So quite remarkable. Thanks so much. Uh, apparently, Katrinka's son, uh, Colton, is a fan of yours and is really happy to see you at <laughs> this festival. So <laughs> just mention that. So. We're now introducing uh, another member of the board, Russ Godfrey. And uh, Russ is a, has been associated with the music scene in Victoria for many years, associated with a number of noted and notorious and almost world famous bands, Walter Bodega Band, Rusty and the Roosters, the old Tin Shack, and on it goes. A big, so Rusty, uh, Russ has been a big part of the music scene. And also, he's known in this area as a very passionate advocate for affordable housing, which is a, a concern of many of us at this time. So, so welcome, Russ Godfrey. Take it away. Hi there. Everyone can hear me? Um, this is my choice. It's, one of, it's my favorite Christmas carol. <clears throat> it's an odd one. It's a modern one. Um, it's a little drummer boy and I'm singing it because I was a drummer for years and years, I still am. And I always loved the idea of having um, that incorporated into a Christmas carol. My issue is as a parent and a grandparent, the last thing I'd want to have around a baby trying to go to sleep is a drummer boy. But nonetheless, here's that song, I love it. <laughs> Finest gifts we bring for up a to lay before the king for up a pop, so to honor him for up a when we come. I have no gift to bring That's fit to give our king 
Shall I play for you, Parapapapam, on my drum? Mary nodded, Parapapapam, the ox and lamb kept time, Parapapapam. I played my drum for him, Parapapapam. I played my best for him, pa ra pa 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 ra pa 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 ra pa 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 Then he smiled at me, pa ra pa 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 Me and my drum, me and my drum, pa ra pa 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 Merry Christmas, everybody. Thank you, Russ. You're Little welcome. Drummer Boy is one of my favorite to carols as well. And uh, it's quite fitting that Russ has been the leader of our lantern procession at the Lights on the Gorge and days that we can have uh, on such a procession. Our next uh, performer. Um, it's actually me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now that I look at my program. <laughs> so just before Russ, you heard Lee tell us delightful stories about the moon in Chinese mythology. In the old pagan tradition, Yule celebrated the moon giving birth to a new sun. In Western Christian tradition, the moon gives way to the star as a heavenly symbol guiding the three wise men to Bethlehem. I'm going to read a poem by the early 20th century Anglo-American poet T.S. Eliot, whom you may know as the author of The Wasteland. The Great War had brought an end to civilization as Eliot's generation had known it. In Journey of the Magi, Eliot speaks in the voice of one of the three wise men or kings as they are also called, who visited the infant Jesus at Bethlehem. Eliot's wise man says very little about the child whose teachings became the basis of Christianity. Instead, he focuses on how hard it is to accept the death of one's old world and the birth of a new order. Like the wise man, or woman, as uh, some of the Christmas cards these today, this year have said, we have been forced this past year to take stock of our lives, to contemplate the possible death of our normal life and the need for a new way of living that is inclusive, just, and sustainable. So here is Eliot's Journey of the Magi. A cold coming we had of it, just the worst time of the year for a journey, and such a long journey. The ways deep and the weather sharp, the very dead of winter. And the camels galled, sore-footed, refactory, lying down in the melting snow. There were times we regretted the summer palaces on slopes, the terraces, and the silken girls bringing sherbet. Then the camel men cursing and grumbling and running away and wanting their liquor and women and the night fires going out and the lack of shelters and the cities hostile and the towns unfriendly and the villages dirty and charging high prices. A hard time we had of it. At the end, we preferred to travel all night sleeping in snatches, with the voices singing in our ears saying that this was all folly. Then at dawn, we came down to a temperate valley, wet below the snow line, smelling of vegetation, with a running stream and a water mill beating the darkness, and three trees on a low sky, and an old white horse galloped away in the meadow. 
Then we came to a tavern with vine leaves over the lintel. Six hands at an open door dicing for pieces of silver and feet kicking the empty wineskins. But there was no information. And so we continued and arrived at evening, not a moment too soon finding the place. It was, you may say, satisfactory. All this was a long time ago, I remember, and I would do it again, but set down this, set down this, where we led all that way for birth or death. There was a birth, certainly. We had evidence and no doubt. I had seen birth and death, but had thought they were different. This birth was hard and bitter agony for us, like death, our death. We returned to our palaces, these kingdoms, but no longer at ease here in the old dispensation with an alien people clutching their gods. I should be glad of another death. I'm not sure how many of us are so eager for another death that we're willing to go along with the suggestion made by the Attorney General of Texas, my home state, that grandparents should gladly sacrifice themselves to COVID to get the economy going again. With that thought, we will shift to more hopeful stories told by Jennifer Ferris. Like Glee, Jennifer is a longtime member of the Victoria's Storytellers Guild who has performed widely. In addition to performing, Jennifer also teaches storytelling. Of course, at the moment, both the telling and the teaching take place online, and she misses the connection with a live audience. So do your best to give Jennifer a warm but silent welcome. Jennifer. Thank you, Kay. I love that poem. What a rich time this has been, music and poetry and and uh, I'm delighted to be invited back again. So I'm going to tell, I'm going to share two stories with you. And the first is a story that you will hear just this once and you will be able to tell it immediately. And you'll see why. It was the shortest day and the longest night of the year. And the family had been preparing for solstice. They had been cooking. There were delicious smells coming out of the kitchen. They had been making small gifts to share. Now the boy, I think he was about nine years old, he wanted to share something too, but well, he didn't have any money to buy gifts and he wasn't good at baking and he wasn't good at making things, but still there must be something that he could contribute. So he thought and he thought and he thought and nothing occurred to him. Well, midday, the family said that they were going into the village to get some last minute supplies and they would stop off and have some time with a neighbor who lived just down the road. Do you want to come? Oh no, said the boy, I'm too busy thinking. Off went the family. And the boy was left in the living room, thinking and thinking and thinking, if only I could squeeze out an idea. Yes, I have an idea. The boy went out of the house and around the back of the barn, through the barn door, where he found an axe. He went out of the barn, across the field, and into the forest. And he walked through the forest, oh, so many beautiful trees, but he was looking for a very special tree. So he kept on walking through the forest until at last he found the perfect tree. I think it was a spruce. What a beauty, thought the boy, but what a shame to cut it down. So he left the tree where it was and he went back through the forest and across the field and into the barn and, and he put away the ax just the way his mother had told him to. And he seized the spade and a sack. And he went out of the barn and across the field and into the forest. And he came to that place where he had seen the beautiful spruce tree. 
and he dug and he dug and he dug until he took out the whole root ball. He put it in the sack and then he dragged the tree back out of the forest, across the field. He put the spade back in the barn and then he went into the house. Oh, but first he got a pot and some soil and he put the tree in the pot and then he dragged it, now it was really heavy, into the house and he just got it into the living room when he heard the family coming back home. When they came into the living room, they said, oh my goodness, you have made the most beautiful solstice tree we've ever seen. Now, this is a very adaptable story because you can tell it as a Christmas story. You can even take that bit of paper that was left behind and face it with a, you know, that old bit of tissue paper from last year's Christmas present that you didn't know what to do with. You can put it behind this and you've got something, a piece of stained glass to put in your front window. And that is the story of the solstice tree. <laughs> now I'm going to pull you in for a more intimate story and shift my screen just a little bit. And I'm going to go, to, I have a very odd screen here, so I'm just going to move, go back to gallery, I think. This uh, story that I'm going to tell you is a folk tale originally from India, and it has been taken and borrowed and has been uh, bent and woven into all kinds of stories. It was even taken by the, the Brazilian writer Paul Coelho into a story that was published in the Globe and Mail some years ago. Well, I've taken that, this story and I've looked at many versions, and this is my version of the music coming from the house. Every year, the king wanted to go into the city to see how people were celebrating the, the, season of, the season of light, solstice. Now, he didn't want people to make a fuss, and so he would go in disguise. He always invited his prime minister to go with him, and they dressed up as merchants from a foreign land, which allowed them to walk through the streets quite anonymously. Oh, how they loved what people were doing. The, his, uh, his, his citizens had decorated with cedar boughs. There were wreaths on the doors. There were candles in the windows of the houses. If you peered inside, you could see that there was greenery decorating the mantelpiece. People were bringing the outside in. They were bringing the forest into their homes. And what was that smell? An aroma of delicious baking and all the streets filled with people hurrying home to share solstice night with their family and friends. Well, the king and his prime minister continued to walk and they must have taken a wrong turning because they ended up in the poorest neighborhood of the city. Here, the streets were almost empty. There were no cedar wreaths and boughs on the, on the doors or decorating the mantelpiece, no candles in the window. The streets were almost deserted. And the king said, I really should do something for the poor. The prime minister gave a grunt of acknowledgement. He'd heard this before, but he knew that once they got back to the palace, oh, the affairs of state, diplomatic visits, or people coming from other countries, he, king would soon forget all about the poor of his kingdom. Well, it seemed as if they had got lost now and they came around a corner into a street where the houses, well, you couldn't really call them houses. They were shacks. Surely nobody lives here, said the king, but from one of the houses, there was light and there was music and singing. I wonder who lives there, said the king. So they approached this little hovel. Now, the planks of wood that had been used to build the walls of this little structure were so old and warped that you could see between them into the house. The king couldn't resist. He looked and what he saw was absurd. An old man sitting in a wheelchair, weeping. A young woman with a shaven head, dancing. A young man with sad eyes playing a tambourine and singing a folk song. What is going on here? Said the king. None of our business, said the prime minister. We should be going too late. The king had knocked on the door. 
The music stopped and within moments, the door was opened by the young man. Uh, what can I do for you? He said. Oh, said the king, we are merchants from a foreign land. We've been doing busy business in your, in your city and uh, we were looking for a, a place to stay and we seem to have lost our way. Perhaps, well, we saw the light from your house. We heard the music. Perhaps we could stay here. <laughs> I don't think so, said the young man. There's nothing here for you. Besides, no one would want to stay in this house of misery. Really, said the king, and why is that? And in a kingly way, pushed past the young man and went right into the little house. There was a long moment of silence. And then the old man raised his head. It's my fault, he said. It's all my fault. Years now, I have been training my son in the art of calligraphy that he might get a job as a scribe at the palace of the king, lift us out of our poverty. But all these years have gone by and not one single job posting. Last night, I had a dream. In my dream, it was night. The sky was filled with stars and out of those stars stepped a woman all dressed in filaments of light, glowing she was, and she spoke to me. The woman said that if I would go to the market and buy a silver goblet, that a king would come to our little house and drink from that goblet and offer my son a job. Oh, fool that I am. What king is going to come to my house? Well, despite my doubts, I told the story to my daughter-in-law. And so she and I went to the market this morning. We have no money to buy a silver goblet, but my dear sweet girl sold her hair, her long, black, beautiful hair. And with the money, we bought the goblet, the goblet that sits upon that table, a goblet that will never meet the lips of a king. Oh, I am a foolish old man. And now my son and his wife are dancing and singing, trying to ra raise me out of my misery. And he continued to weep. Well, that is a very interesting story, said the king. My friend and I should really be uh, returning to the part of town that has hotels, but you know, I'm so thirsty. Uh, could I have a drink of water before I leave? Well, of course, water was brought and poured into the very best vessel in the house as befits the, the generosity of towards a guest. The king drank the water from the goblet. He put it back on the table and he said, I'm going now, but you know, when we were in the marketplace this morning, we heard someone mention that there might be a job posting at the palace. You should definitely pay attention and listen for pronouncements. The king and the prime minister left the little house and returned to the palace. The next day, a proclamation was read out at the marketplace and at street corners. Scribe wanted at the palace. All those qualified will come to the palace on a certain day, some 10, year, 10 days hence, to sit an examination. On the appointed day, 125 qualified scribes arrived at the palace. They were taken into a great hall. In that hall, there was row upon row upon row of desks. Each desk had a pen, a bottle of ink, and two pieces of white paper. The applicants sat at the desk and waited. At last, the prime minister entered the room. He said, the examination to find out who is best fitted for the job will be in the form of a, an essay, a composition. Your essay must answer this question. Why does an old man in a wheelchair weep? Why does a young woman with a shaven head dance? Why does a young man with sad eyes play a tambourine and sing a folk song? Begin. The people in the hall looked at one another. What, what does that mean? How can we possibly write about that? But in the far corner of the hall was a young man with a pale, tired face. 
a young man with, with weary, worn clothing who smiled, picked up his pen, dipped it in the ink bottle and began to write. Thank you for listening to my Solstice stories. Thank you, Jennifer. That was a very, very moving story. Both good stories, but the second one, very moving indeed. Thanks so much. And thank, to, thank you to the two of you for coming from Victoria Storytellers Guild. I always enjoy you every year. So, our next, uh, our next performer um, happens to be me. And uh, I have to master a certain technology to do this. Um, so I'm going to sing a, a carol, but it's a carol that's very familiar to you, but also changed. And the story of the carol is that when I was growing up in a small English town and going to the Church of England, we learned lots of hymns and lots of carols, but we also learned about social class which I was not at the top of. And, uh, and I, I, for years I thought, this, there was, well, as I went away and became a Marxist for a while and then various other kinds of less extreme things, uh, I, I wanted to do something about this Carol situation. And in recent years, I came across a pagan version of God Rest Ye Merry Gentlemen. And I thought, aha, I am going to turn this into a common person's carol. So we don't need we don't need to write carol. We don't need to have gentlemen, white gentlemen, upper class white gentlemen and carols anymore. Uh, we could have the common people, and we don't need God necessarily as the great white gentleman. We could have a different concept. So so this is called O oh, Rest Ye Merry Common Folk, and. Do sing along to the uh, refrain is the same, but the words are different. And uh, as long as I don't press the wrong arrow on the screen, which I'm terrified I will do, I, I should be able to get to the end of it. Okay, so it goes as follows. Oh, rest ye merry common folk, let nothing you dismay. Remember that the sun returns upon this solstice day. The growing dark is ended now, and spring is on the way. O oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. O oh, tidings of comfort and joy. The winter's worst still lies ahead. Fierce tempest, snow and rain. Beneath the blanket on the ground, the sparks of life remain. The sun's warm rays caress the seed to raise life's song again. All oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. All oh, tidings of comfort and joy. Within the blessed apple lies the promise of the seed, the promise of the new year that we shall banish greed, that earth shall blossom once again, meet every being's need. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. We gather in together around a fire bright. In cold and dark, we recognize the winter's longest night. The bells ring out, our hearts rejoice. We welcome back the light. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. Thank you. So half of that song was written by Robert Barlow, a local songwriter, and half was written by me. And now we have a poem by Barry Hunt. Barry Hunt has lived in Victoria, North Vancouver, 
Mexico and is currently living in Nanaimo and offering various workshops in eldering, purpose, happiness, etc. And you can find out his, about his workshops if you're interested at his website called a focus on happiness, all one word, dot com. And uh, I've, Barry has offered a number of poems to the Church of Truth newsletter, which I've been really happy to publish. So he has, uh, he has uh, uh, been published lots in our newsletter. And he's reading his own poem, which is called Waiting for the Oak King. So welcome, Barry. And he's also our co-host, by the way. Uh, so in the in the terrifying moments before this, we were all consulting about what the hell we could do about it. So thanks, Barry, for being a co-host. Thanks very much, Chris. Uh, loved your carol. Um, so a little bit of background and sort of context for my poem today. Um, the winter solstice in Celtic tradition is called Yule or Yuletide. And it marks the time when once more the light begins to wax and the days slowly get longer. Traditionally, this is the time that also marks the beginning of the rule of the Oak King who oversees the coming months of fertility and abundance. So the poem I'm about to read uh, will now speak to this time of waiting on the Oak King. Our blood and bones know that our way is the wheel of the year, turning through the seasons, turning till the darkest turn when all stands still. Our blood and bones know the Yuletide night, waiting on the Oak King, waiting on the light, standing round the bonfire that cold, dark night. Our blood and bones know when the wheel turns towards the waxing light. Then we all cheer, long reign the Oak King, long reign the light. <laughs> Happy solstice. <laughs> Thank you, Barry. I love the poem. It has that real ritualistic feel, you know taking you into an ancient time. So much appreciated. And Barry, thank you. Uh, maybe not the Oak King, but uh, the depiction you see there is the Holly King. And it is time that the green man made an appearance. So a happy solstice to you all. I'm sorry we cannot bring you the Mummer's Play this year in person because obviously we're not allowed to do that. Uh, but what I can offer for you is um, a somewhat shortened video version of the play that was actually recorded at Seasider about five years ago. And I'm going to pick up the play at the start of the, uh, the dance. And that leads on into the central element of the play, which is the fight. And so just bear with me one moment while I share my screen. And uh, this runs for about eight minutes and then I will reappear. And I'm hoping and assuming you can see that.
So, in comes I, green man of old. I'm here to banish winter's cold, to call in spring whose gentle rain will turn the seasons round again. Then comes summer, fall, then winter, when once again we mummers enter. Well, I hope you have enjoyed our show. We've done the best we could. And now that it is almost done, we hope you've understood that our purpose is to celebrate the turning of the year. So we wish you joy and happiness, great mirth and great good cheer. And if you think our efforts are worthy of applause, in a moment you may clap, twill be for a very good cause. But ere we go, I'll sing for you a jolly glad wassail and collect some IOUs so later I can buy some ale. Wassail, wassail, all over the town. Our toast it is white and our ale it is brown. Our bowl it is made of the white maple tree. With a wassailing bowl we'll drink to thee. Drink to thee, drink to thee. With a wassailing bowl, we'll drink to thee. So here's to the maid in the lily white smock, who trips to the door and pulls back the lock, who trips to the door and pulls back the pin, for a let we jolly wassailers in. Wassailers in, wassailers in, for a let we jolly wassailers in. So here is to Dobbin and to his right eye. May God send the master a good Christmas pie and a good Christmas pie that we may all see. With a wassailing bowl, I'll drink to thee. Drink to thee, drink to thee. With a wassailing bowl, I'll drink to thee. Happy solstice, one and all. So that concludes 
the uh, entertainment for today. We hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, Chris, I don't know if you have any last words before we uh, d go out, but I'm going to, in a moment, start the slideshow again so that that can continue. And in answer to somebody's question, all of those photos were taken within the last week or so right here in the Gorge Silicon neighborhood. So they're you or your friends and neighbors. Chris, Kay, anything you want to add? Oh, just a thanks to you, Trevor, and to Barry, the, the co-Zoom host, and to you all for coming. We've really, we've had a good time. We had a lot of nerve wracking moments before, and it's been great <laughs> as it unfolded. So thanks for everyone, performers, audience, you've been, uh, you've been great. And we will try to have the real thing next year with real people, real life, really in place. And we all look forward to that. Okay, thanks everyone. Bye bye. And here comes the slideshow. If you want to stick around and watch it. Takes a moment. <laughs>